Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, your uh, SETI um, colloquium series. So today we are very lucky to have uh, with us Paul Ain. Uh, Paul is a, a child of the Bay Area, <laughs> I will say. It's, um, he, um, he basically uh, got his bachelor and master uh, degrees in geophysics at Stanford University. So it's a small university not too far away from here, right? <laughs> um, in 2003 and 2005. Uh, Paul then moved to uh, UCLA uh, for a PhD that he finalized in 2010. So after a very short postdoc at Caltech University with uh, Odette Harrison, Harrison, I'm practicing this, Harrison's group, uh, he joined JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, approximately a year ago, two years ago. Um, so Paul is truly a Californian because he likes surfing as well, but he's not gonna talk about surf today. Um, his main interest is in geophysics. Um, uh, he's basically like he studied the nature and history of water and other volatiles on planets and moons, as well as the origins and distribution of habitable environments in the solar system. I stole that from your website. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was a co-recipient of uh, numerous gr uh, group awards at NASA, including one in 2010-2011 on the Mars Climate Sounder Science Team with the cl Mars, clim Mars Climate Sounder Science Team, uh, in 2011 with the Lunar Radiometeor Science Team, and he also got a, uh, an award from the Keck Institute of Space Studies for new approaches uh, to lunar ice detection and mapping. That was in 2013. Uh, so today, Paul will talk about uh, carbon dioxide carbon dioxide, so snowfalls, polar caps, and the clim climate of Mars. Uh, we highlight the dynamic polar processes at the heart of the Martian CO2 cycle revealed by the uh, Mars climate sonders. Please join us and welcome Paul. Thank you very much, Frank. Well, it's really an honor to be here. Um, my first contact with SETI was as a kid watching Cosmos, as I'm sure um, a lot of the younger people in the room uh, can relate to. Um, and I also, from a fairly early age, participated in the SETI at Home project. And I was convinced that my computer was going to be the one to discover that signal, <laughs> the wow signal. So it's really a, a pleasure to be here. So as Frank said, I'm going to talk today about the climate of Mars and its relationship with the stuff that goes on at the poles. So I'm going to talk about the polar caps and the interaction between the, the atmosphere and the climate and the polar caps. So um, this is a scale representation of the Earth and, and Mars. And we often think of, of Mars as being one of the most, or maybe the most, Earth-like planet in our solar system, which is true in many ways. Um, and in fact, Ancient Mars may have been much more like Earth than present-day Mars. Um, this diagram shows the spin axis tilts of the two planets, which are, are very similar. And that uh, leads to similar uh, seasonal cycles on both planets. But what I want to talk about today is, is one of the key differences between the two planets, which is that on Earth, this sort of key molecule not just from a, a biological standpoint, but also from a, a climate standpoint, is, is water. Whereas on Mars, the, the key molecule is really carbon dioxide. And so just like on Earth, where water dominates um, the, the greenhouse effect and a lot of the uh, interactions that lead to, to various climate processes on our, our planet, carbon dioxide is really at the, the heart of many of the, the climate processes that, that occur on Mars. So the three different reservoirs for, for CO2 that I'm going to talk about today are shown here. Um, the, the main one that, that I study is the, the seasonal ice caps, which are, in fact, composed of, of carbon dioxide. So the atmosphere uh, feeds into the permanent CO2 ice cap through the seasonal ice caps. And they can exchange mass back and forth between these different reservoirs. And the, the, the quantities and the rates at which the CO2 is exchanged between these reservoirs have big impl implications for the present day climate of Mars and also the past climate. So first I'm going to start off talking about the, 
the atmosphere and climate of Mars. Um, a lot of talks on the climate of Mars that you'll see focus on the, the past climate, whereas in my case, I'm more interested in, in the present day climate of Mars, which I think helps us understand how the climate has changed over time so dramatically. So I just wanted to give a, a, a little bit of background so that everyone's on the same page um, about these, these two different climates. So on Earth, our atmosphere is composed mainly of nitrogen, with um, uh, a secondary constituent being oxygen, which is obviously very important for life. Um, we do have some CO2, but it's not nearly as significant as it is on Mars. So on Mars, the atmosphere is composed of 95% uh, carbon dioxide, with minor components of uh, non-condensable gases, and then just a very tiny amount of, of water vapor on average, which obviously changes depending on the season and uh, location. Um, the other major difference between the, the atmospheres of the two planets is that the surface pressure on Mars is much, much lower, almost a factor of 1,000 lower than on Earth. So you, you can imagine on Earth, you'd have to go up to the stratosphere to experience pressures that you typically experience on uh, the surface of Mars. Um, the surface temperatures are, are different, but not too, too different. So um, during the summer on Mars, temperatures can rise above uh, free the freezing point of water. Uh, but on average, the temperature is significantly lower on Mars. And um, you'd really have to go to places like Antarctica to, to experience even what happens in the tropics on, on Mars. I mentioned the spin axis uh, tilts of the two planets. So Mars is, is tilted just a little bit more than Earth, which leads to, to seasons with an amplitude that are, are comparable to, to on Earth. Um, another major difference is that the eccentricity of the Martian orbit is higher than, than Earth's, and that leads to um, an asymmetry in the season, such that the southern hemisphere summer is short and more intense than the northern hemisphere summer. Something similar happens on Earth, but to a much lesser extent that we don't even really notice it. Um, so the net, net, the net difference between these two planets is that Mars is, is a far colder and, uh, colder and far drier planet than Earth. Um, it has longer seasons by about a factor of two, um, and it's got this short and intense southern summer, um, and also has an extensive polar night, just like on Earth. It extends down to about 65 degrees latitude. So this is a diagram showing the, the seasons. So you can see here again in the southern uh, summer on the left-hand side of the, the diagram, the, the planet is closer to the sun, which means that it's moving faster in its orbit, so the, that season is shorter. But it, being closer, it's also more intense. So the in intensity of insulation at the surface is higher, uh, but the duration is, is less. And actually, if you average out uh, or integrate the total insulation for, for each of the poles, it's identical. Uh, but the distribution in terms of the, the amplitude of that, that insulation is, is uh, higher in, in the south. So this is uh, one of the major features of the present day Martian climate. And I'm going to focus a lot of this talk on this global CO2 cycle. So um, believe it or not, on Mars, the atmospheric pressure, if you were to sit on the surface with a barometer and just measure the, the pressure, it would, it would fluctuate day to day and hour to hour. But imprinted on top of, of, of that fluctuation, or maybe underneath it, is this sort of sinusoidal pattern that you see in this, this plot here. And this is an actual set of measurements from Viking lander over the course of the entire Mars year um, for the, the two, two Viking landers. And so what you see here is there's about a 30% a change in the atmospheric pressure over the course of the year. Um, and I'm going to talk in detail about why that's the case. But what's happening is that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually condensing seasonally at the poles. And depending on, uh, on which pole is, is experiencing winter, uh, you have these two sinusoids over, over printed on top of one another. So the, the peak corresponds to um, the southern summer, and uh, the lowest trough corresponds to southern winter. Um, and this was actually predicted uh, by uh, th th uh, using theoretical models for the, the condensation of CO2 at the poles during, during winter. So why do we care about these pressure variations? Well, it turns out that on, on Mars, you know, we all know that liquid water is not stable for long periods on the surface of Mars. And one of the reasons for that is not just the, the temperature, but also the, the pressure. So basically, uh, at the average pressure of, of Earth, um, of, of Mars, excuse me, uh, which is about six 
six millibars of CO2 that's right near the, the triple point of, of water, which is shown on this diagram. So uh, at the, the triple point of, of water, if the pressure dips much below that, then you transition straight from solid water to, to vapor, so the ice sublimates. Once you've raised the pressure above that point, then you can have this, this uh, region that's shaded here in red where liquid water is, is stable, as long as the temperature is, is above the, the, um, the freezing point. So if you, if you imagine, you, if you could put more atmospheric CO2 back into Mars' atmosphere, you would raise the average pressure above that six millibar triple point, and you'd have a, a larger region of liquid water stability. And so that's why we care about these small changes in pressure. In fact, the seasonal pressure, because it varies by 30%, there are periods during the Martian year when water would be more stable at uh, elevations where the pressure is above the triple point. And we do see evidence for not just past aqueous activity on Mars. There's evidence that, that there could be processes going on in, on Mars today that involve flowing liquid water. And so one of the questions is how, you, how could you possibly maintain liquid water at these pressures and temperatures? And um, in reality, uh, Mars does experience the thermodynamic conditions for, for liquid water occasionally. There's another interesting aspect to this CO2 cycle, which is that it profoundly influences the, the weather and the, the climate. So um, during the summertime, when the, the seasonal CO2 cap, which is shown here, this is an actual image um, from MRO, I believe, uh, when, when the CO2 cap is sublimating back into the atmosphere, it's injecting a massive amount of CO2 uh, that 30% that I mentioned, back into the atmosphere. And so you get these huge uh, um, pressure gradients. And so the, the, uh, the CO2 wants to flow back towards the pole, and that's shown by this arrow here. And you get uh, not only very strong winds, but baroclinic instabilities um, that, that uh, drive dust, what they call cap-edge dust storms. And that's what's shown here. This is a, a dust storm that was initiated by the flow of CO2 from the sublimating uh, carbon dioxide seasonal cap uh, equatorward, and, and those strong winds kicked up dust into the atmosphere and, and generated this uh, regional dust storm. In some ways, Mars, the, the present day climate of Mars, bears more resemblance to outer solar system objects than it does to Earth. So the comparison I'm making here is to Pluto and Neptune's moon Triton, uh, which also have seasonally variable atmospheres obviously on a much longer time scale given their longer orbits. Um, the plot at the bottom right shows uh, this effect for Pluto, where basically if you measured the atmospheric pressure profile back in 1988 and then made the same, same measurement in 2002 as was done, uh, you would see an increase in the atmospheric pressure. And that's just due to the same process that's happening on Mars. As Pluto gets closer to the sun, more of the ice is sublimating back into the atmosphere. In this case, it's ma mainly methane ice. Um, and something similar um, apparently happens on, on the moon Triton, uh, but in, in that case, it's nitrogen ice. So if you moved Earth out to Triton's distance from the sun, um, our nitrogen would condense onto the surface. We would lose our atmosphere, but we would still maintain this thin, seasonally variable atmosphere. So the point of all this is that the, the condensation of, of CO2 at the poles has a profound influence on, on the climate of Mars. Um, and I'm going to talk about how this, this, uh, how this plays out and what implications it has for the past climate of Mars. Okay, so the next topic is the polar caps. How did the, the polar caps fit into this story? So the polar caps were actually one of the first things known about the planet Mars with any certainty. Um, so back in 1672, Giovanni Cassini, the Cassini, uh, observed white patches on Mars, the first one at the South Pole. Um, and then actually, uh, about 30-some years later, his nephew, uh, Giacomo, discovered a similar bright spot at the North Pole. So, so at that point, in the early 1700s, it was known that Mars had polar ice caps. Um, and by analogy, throughout that s century, they, uh, they noted that they, they grow and they shrink. And so by analogy with Earth, they're probably made of water ice, just like our seasonal sea ice caps are. And then. That analogy led to some pretty crazy ideas. So uh, because you could see that the, 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 ice, uh, the ice was the only known or suspected place on Mars that had lots of, of water, um, the rest of the planet looked 
reddish and, and kind of dry. Uh, and then uh, some of the observers uh, were tricked into thinking that they saw linear features on the surface of Mars, which they drew on maps. And the idea was propagated that the Martians were a, a dying race that needed to siphon water from the polar caps to the lower latitudes, which had, had dried out, probably, be, probably because of something that they had done wrong to the planet. And so it was this kind of romantic idea um, that basically persisted for, for many decades. Um, and then in the 1960s, there was this really seminal and, and fascinating paper that came out by uh, Robert Layton and Bruce Murray at Caltech that showed that, that basically the, the temperatures that you would predict based on their physical models uh, dropped below the local CO2 frost point at the poles, which meant that CO2 should condense. And in fact, they showed, out, showed that the atmospheric temperatures were far too low to be able to transport enough water vapor to account for the seasonal growth and, and shrinkage of the, the polar caps. So their, their paper basically predicted that you know, when and if we had good um, spacecraft measurements of, of the polar caps, that they would in fact be composed of carbon dioxide and not water ice as, as had been suspected. So sure enough, the spacecraft observations, when, when we first started to get good data in the 1960s and 70s. Um, they confirmed nearly all of Leighton and Murray's predictions, um, including the important fact that the polar caps are made of CO2 ice predominantly, the seasonal caps. OK, so this is what we're looking at. So the seasonal caps uh, extend to roughly 55 degrees latitude, which is quite far from the poles. So you can see that there's this very extensive region of Mars that gets covered in, in seasonal CO2 frost. Um, in the deepest places, it's several meters thick, so um, you could ski on it, presumably. Uh, there, are, uh, perennial, there are perennial ice caps on Mars, but the only perennial CO2 deposit that exists is at the South Pole. And it's not exactly clear why it would be the South Pole, but I'll talk about that more later. The North, seasonal, the, sorry, the North Permanent Cap, or the North Residual Ice Cap, is composed of only water ice, in many places covered by uh, a fairly thick layer of dust. This is a neat animation uh, of pictures taken by the Marcy instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And what's shown here is the seasonal uh, sublimation and, and retreat of the southern seasonal ice cap. And the things to notice here are that there, there's a lot of complex behavior going on here. It's not just a, a single, um, simple process. You can see some, some areas that are brighter than others. There are areas that have some kind of dark lanes and other structure uh, towards the top of the, the ice cap. And then you see those dust storms that I mentioned before. So in this case, this uh, cap edge storm um, was violent and uh, catastrophic enough to lead to a, a global dust storm, which is not always the case. So there's some really interesting things that happen within this retreating seasonal ice cap, which people um, have gotten pretty excited about in recent years. So here's some images of, of what we call fans and spiders. So the top two frames show different stages of the evolution of fans. Um, and what we think these are is, is basically in, in the, that dark part of the seasonal ice cap that I just showed in the animation. That's called the cryptic region. And it's more or less uh, solid CO2 slab ice what's called slab ice. And so it's uh, more or less transparent to the sun's rays. And the, transparent, the, the sunlight penetrates the transparent slab, slab CO2 ice to the bottom of it, heats up the ground below, which sublimates the ice cap from below, creates a layer of, of gas. And then that gas, once the pressure is high enough, breaks the ice and shoots out into a jet and then the, the dust that's carried with it creates this fan. So these jets um, are, are widespread and create these dusty patches on, on the surface. Once the CO2 ice then completely sublimates away, what's left behind are these things called spiders, which are down below there. And what we think these are is the, the tracks that the CO2 gas takes as the, this violent um, explosion of, of CO2 is, is happening. Um, but the, the, the exact mechanism and, and the morphology of these kind of uh, sinuous meandering uh, patterns are not really well understood yet. Underneath all this, underneath this, the seasonal ice cap, is uh, the permanent water ice cap. And one of the major features of, of these permanent ice caps is these um, 
polar layered deposits. And <clears throat> anytime you see layers in geology, whether it's in ice or rocks, um, you should immediately think of, of uh, cycles, probably some kind of uh, climatic or um, fluvial cycle. So in this case, uh, we, we believe that these layers are recording uh, cyclical changes in the climate of Mars over time scales of uh, anywhere from hundreds of thousands of years to uh, more than a million years. And both, both poles have these polar layer deposits. Here's a nice um, zoomed in image. And so the, the layers themselves um, are composed of alternating layers of, of dusty ice and more or less pure ice. So for whatever reason, there were dusty periods and then relatively dust-free periods of deposition. OK, so kind of putting it all together, this is a nice uh, view from the uh, radar data from, from Mars Express. And what they were able to do is to actually measure the bottom, the, the, the base of the polar layered deposits here, um, and, and measure the, the, the thickness of the permanent water ice cap. So the, the bottom right figure shows the extent of this, this permanent water ice cap. And so you should keep in mind that this, this vast uh, water ice cap at the South Pole, which persists um, year to year, uh, on top of that, really only has this tiny little area of, of carbon dioxide. So that's the, the top arrow there, points to the, the CO2 residual cap. And that only occurs at the South Pole. So in the North Pole, it's kind of the same story, but you don't have this permanent CO2 cap on top of the water ice cap. So it's sort of this layer, layer cake kind of uh, situation. So I want to get back to these reservoirs. So I've talked about the, the permanent CO2 ice cap that's shown on the bottom here. There's the seasonal ice, CO2 ice caps happening on top. And then those are exchanging with the atmosphere uh, on seasonal time scales. So what's the amount of material in these different reservoirs? So this bar plot shows that. So the total amount is there. And then the seasonal ice caps exchange about 30% of that material every year. And then there's this tiny little amount in the perennial cap. So that little perennial CO2 cap at the South Pole um, has less than 5% of, of the amount that's exchanged with the atmosphere every year. And so one question you could ask is, you know, given the amount of, of material that's, that's being exchanged back and forth between the atmosphere and, and the, the seasonal caps, why is it that, that, that this perennial CO2 deposit is, is so small in comparison? You would think that some years, if the seasonal cycle overshot, it might sublimate all of that back into the atmosphere, and, and there wouldn't be a, a, uh, a permanent CO2 cap. And that's a reasonable hypothesis. So there actually is some evidence that that might be happening. Um, in this case, we're looking at on, on the right side there, this is a, an image of the, the permanent CO2 cap at the South Pole. And you're seeing th a, a difference of three Mars years. So the, the bottom part of the frame shows that particular, what, what's called a Swiss cheese pit. That pit was imaged in, uh, I believe, 1999. And then again, three Mars years later. And you see that it's, it's growing. And so there's some process that's actually eating away at the, the permanent CO2 um, at the South Pole. And so you know, one question is, if this process continued at this rate, how long would it take to put all the CO2 in this cap back into the atmosphere? Um, and it's not very long. It's, it's a, a blink of an eye on uh, geologic time scales. So maybe it's the case that the South Polar residual CO2 cap isn't stable. And it is going away. And we're witnessing climate change on Mars. This could be caused by um, at least two effects. One effect is the um, obliquity cycles that Mars experiences. So um, without the stabilizing effects of a moon like Earth's moon, Mars experiences these tugs and pulls from the other planets that cause it to tilt more and, and to a lesser extent on its side. That's called the obliquity. And the obliquity cycles are shown in the upper left part of that plot. Um, these happen on, on time scales of tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Those cycles do have an influence on the amount of, of CO2 that we'd expect to disappear from the South Pole. And that's what's shown on, on that, uh, those curves there. So the present day amount of CO2 in terms of the pressure is shown as the little red uh, error bars there at the present obliquity value. And so what would happen is if you in increase the obliquity, you, you would drive the, the polar energy balance uh, towards sublimating more of that CO2 back into the atmosphere. And you'd, you'd rise up on that curve. Um, 
<coughs> Conversely, if you decrease the obliquity, more of the CO2 in the atmosphere would tend to condense. The, the total atmospheric pressure would, would go down. The same thing can happen if you change the albedo of the cap. In other words, the amount of sunlight that the cap tends to absorb. Um, and so those are the, the three different curves. And those can have just as much of an impact on the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere as the obliquity cycles. So it's possible this is happening and it's something to investigate. Then, just a couple of years ago, there was this exciting discovery. Um, and this came from radar data. Um, and what's shown here is, is they found these, what they're calling reflection-free zones within the, the southern perennial cap. So underneath that permanent CO2 ice layer, there's actually these areas that, that have um, property, radar properties that are not consistent with, with water ice. And they are consistent with uh, solid CO2. So the um, conclusion of, of that study was that these reflection-free zones are actually um, permanent CO2 deposits that are much more extensive than what we thought was there in terms of the, the permanent CO2 cap. In fact, if you took all this newly discovered CO2 and put it into the atmosphere, it would constitute another Mars atmosphere, basically. So you get another 6 to 10 millibars to, to work with. Um, and if the obliquity cycles are operating in the way that we think, they could release this back into the, into the atmosphere on 10,000 year time scales. And, and as I mentioned before, the reason that's important is because if you raise the global atmospheric pressure of Mars, then you, you raise the, or you increase the um, stability of liquid water on the surface. So that can be really exciting. Okay. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about new observations from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the specific instrument or data set I'm, I'm going to talk about is the Mars Climate Sounder. So this instrument had uh, several different science goals, and one of the main goals was to characterize uh, the, the polar regions in terms of their relationship to the present-day climate of Mars. So the two questions that I wanted to look at were, how do the seasonal caps form? And you, know, you can imagine two different ways. Maybe the, the frost actually forms directly on the surface, like the frost on your lawn, um, or maybe the CO2 is actually condensing in the atmosphere and, and precipitating out as, as snowfall. Um, and those two, it turns out those two different processes will have different implications for the climate. So that was why we, we were interested in that. We also wanted to address uh, what are the, the important processes happening at the poles that regulate the, the CO2 cy cycle and climate. I mentioned how the CO2 cycle influences the climate. What exactly are these processes that influence that? And are they measurable with this instrument? So uh, we arrived at Mars in, in late 2006. Um, this instrument is unique because it has the ability to, to scan independently of the spacecraft. So the instrument's shown at the upper right there and uh, attached to the, the spacecraft um, in the middle there. So uh, with this scanning capability, we can look up both at the, at the atmosphere and at the surface nearly simultaneously. So we can see what's going on in the atmosphere above a particular region that we also observe um, on the surface. So these were some of the first images that MCS uh, sent back. So we get uh, visible and multiple different wavelengths in the, the thermal infrared. The dark patch in the middle of the, uh, the middle figure is the, the uh, summertime pole. And it shows up darker because it's, it's colder. So this is a sort of sa uh, sample snapshot of the, the kind of data that we get. So on the left is the atmospheric data. You get these profiles of essentially temperature uh, we also retrieve pressure profiles and uh, profiles of atmospheric dust and water ice clouds and even CO2 ice clouds. And then we also simultaneously get these surface measurements that show the, the thermal emission from the surface. So we're measuring surface temperature and also composition. Um, here's an example of what some of these profiles look like. So I, I mentioned we get uh, temperature, uh, water ice opacity, CO2 ice opacity. So one of the motivations for this was that a lot of the models had predicted the occurrence of CO2 snow clouds at the poles. And so that's what's shown here. Um, these are, are plots at different seasons uh, done here at Ames um, <coughs> that show regions where they expect, based on their, their uh, general circulation models, where they expect CO2 snow clouds to occur. And so we uh, wanted to use this new instrument to, to test and, and to search for these, these clouds and see if they, in fact, do occur and if they occur in the locations predicted by the models. Just prior to this, the, uh, one of the previous Mars missions actually measured uh, direct evidence for these CO2 snow clouds, and that's shown here. So 
on the left is a, a sort of transect um, as the spacecraft is flying along, and then the vertical axis is, is altitude. So you're looking at a, a, a cross section of the Mars atmosphere over the pole. And these little dots on the plot are um, echoes within the atmosphere. So this was a, a, a laser altimeter that was intended to, to measure surface elevation. And in this case, they started getting these echoes that were clearly not from the surface. Um, in between their, their good surface measurements, they would get echoes that were you know, many kilometers up in the atmosphere. And the interpretation is that these are echoes off of thick clouds. So the cloud tops are reflecting the, the laser signal back to the, the spacecraft. What's plotted on the right, then, is the distribution of these, these clouds. So now with the Mars Climate Sounder, we can check and see if those clouds are actually occur uh, occurring by their direct thermal emission. So in fact, this is one of the first uh, measurements that MCS made. These are, uh, again, cross-sections through the atmosphere, um, this time in thermal emission in uh, three different wavelengths. And so we immediately saw that there were a few different kinds of clouds occurring, and they had different spectral properties. So um, in this case, the spectral properties of the, the clouds on the right were cl uh, clearly identified with carbon dioxide um, snow. Um, and then we can monitor these clouds through time and see how they, they behave over, over the course of the season. That's what's shown here. So in this case, this is the south polar winter. And you can see the cloud evolving through time uh, towards the end of, of polar, polar winter down at the bottom right. Uh, the cloud is almost non-existent. So we can even quantify the, the snowfall rates. Um, I'll skip that. Um, so <clears throat> using these profiles, we can quantify the, the rates of, of snowfall. So we basically retrieve the profile of, of the CO2, uh, the CO2 snow cloud density. And then using that profile, we, we calculate a, a sedimentation flux at the surface. So how, what's the, the rate of, of mass deposition at the surface of these CO2 particles. So the snowfall rate that we get um, turn out to correspond to about 3 to 20 percent of the total deposition rate. So there's simultaneously frost growing up from the bottom, and then at the same time you have snowfall occurring um, from above. So you're mixing in both snowfall and uh, frost from below. So an interesting aspect of this whole process is that uh, the formation of, of CO2 snow clouds actually uh, creates a, a runaway effect. There's positive feedbacks on the, the formation and growth of, of CO2 snow clouds, and that's because once you start growing snow particles in the atmosphere, that increases the efficiency with which the atmosphere emits radiation to space. Hence, it increases the cooling rate of the atmosphere and uh, leads to more uh, formation of, of CO2 snow particles. So that's a positive feedback. So basically, what happens here is that once the snow, snow cloud, once the atmosphere cools enough to, to allow uh, snow particles to form, um, it'll run away and, and form the snow cloud uh, until there's no longer any um, what we call condensation nuclei. So you need dust particles or, or water ice particles to condense the CO2 onto. And once those are depleted, the cloud will uh, uh, stop, stop growing. But until that happens, you can as I mentioned, uh, snow out a lot of the atmosphere, uh, in that particular case, up to 20% of the atmosphere onto the surface. So this actually has pretty big implications for the, uh, the climate in the following way. So uh, these are maps of, of snapshots in time of the south polar region of Mars. Um, in this case, this is uh, sort of a map of, of the occurrence of snowfall. And What's, sh what's shown here are, are temperatures of the surface. And in this case, the colder temperatures uh, correspond to uh, greater snowfall rates. And so what happens here is that because the snowfall uh, lowers the effective temperature of the surface, it, it decreases the amount of, of thermal emission to space from, from the, the surface, which uh, tends to reduce the total amount of, of condensation. Um, that's not at all intuitive, but that's basically the, uh, the net result of snowfall is that it reduces the total amount of accumulation of seasonal CO2. Um, and in, in the background, just for fun, people ask, you know, what does a CO2 snow particle look like? These are some of the only, the only that I know of, the only uh, images of, of CO2 snow particles. These were produced in, in the lab under uh, Martian conditions by the Department of Agriculture, for whatever reason. Uh, and 
these, uh, so these, these particles form what they call a cuboctahedral shape, and that's based on just the, the bonding characteristics of the CO2 molecule. Um, that's the preferred shape. And they, the particles shown here are comparable in size to the, the ones that we measure on Mars. So this is more or less what, what Martian snow would look like. This is a movie of, of the MCS observations kind of showing a, a typical southern hemisphere winter. So this is what you're seeing in, in the, the blues and yellows are the, the uh, snowfall activity. And you can see lots of interesting structure here. Um, but one of the main features is this uh, gigantic snow cloud that seems to persist on the pole but just slightly offset. And, and you can see that the, the offset is towards the upper left. And that's uh, in the direction of the permanent CO2 cap. So it turns out that it, the, the snowiest place in the southern hemisphere is actually right over that permanent CO2 cap. And that may not be a coincidence. It may be the, the case that the, um, the weather patterns in the southern winter uh, cause increased snowfall there. The uh, deposits that, that occur due to snowfall tend to be the, those with the highest albedo, so they reject more of the sunlight than other regions, and that would cause a self-preserving effect, basically. Another interesting thing to point out here is, is the occurrence of all these little tiny cold spots. Um, and those tend to be associated with, with specific craters. Um, and we think that's uh, an orographic effect where the wind is driven upslope, and that causes adiabatic cooling, which leads to, to snowfall. So there would be little, little regions near, near topography that would accumulate more snow. And then in, it, it does turn out that when you look at the albedo data, the, the brightness of, of the seasonal deposits as the, as the cap recedes, you'll see these little patches that, that do correlate with these areas of, of increased snowfall. The snowfall regions also correlate with, with the thickness of the seasonal ice cap. So here on the left is shown the thickness of the cap derived from that same uh, altimetry data. So what they did here was basically when they had uh, crossover passes uh, during one season and then another, they could see a thickness or a, an elevation change, and that was due to the, the disappearance of the seasonal ice cap. That's what's shown on the left. And on the right, this is a map of the um, occurrence of snowfall. And it turns out that the places where it snows a lot tend to get the thickest deposits. Um, and we think that's just due to the fact that you get a fluffier deposit. It's probably less, less dense than the um, directly condensed uh, surface frost. Um, so we can compare the, the occurrence of, of these snow deposits with the laser uh, echoes. And it's not a perfect correlation, but uh, we do see this, the same sort of zonal asymmetries that they observed in um, the echo data. Um, another interesting thing is that there's this remarkable repeatability from year to year. So this is the southern hemisphere. This is the occurrence of snowfall again. And then the, there's these features that seem to pop up um, in both years. Um, in fact, we see these, these same patterns every single year. So there's certain places on Mars that, for whatever reason, tend to be uh, uh, the, the focus of, of enhanced snow, uh, snowfall. And I'm just pointing out a few of those here. The north is different from the south in the following way. So um, the, the northern hemisphere winter occurs, obviously, during southern summer. And, and that's also the season when most of the big dust storms occur on Mars. And so the dust storm activity in the southern hemisphere leads to, to wide variability in the amount of snowfall in the northern hemisphere. And I don't know if you can see it in this, this diagram here, but this is two different Mars years looking at the same snapshot in time um, between those two different years, uh, the amount of snowfall in, in the northern hemisphere. And you can see there's, there was much less uh, snowfall in, in Mars year 29 than there was in Mars year 30. And that turns out to be driven by this dust storm activity in, in the southern hemisphere. So this may prevent the northern hemisphere from accumulating as much snow as the south. Just the fact that the southern summer is more intense, leading to more dust storms, which drives the uh, heating of the northern hemisphere and uh, leading to less uh, snowfall. OK, so this has implications for the, the, the overall climate of Mars which I'll spend the rest of the time talking about. And I promise I'll stop in time for questions. Um, so you don't need to memorize this equation, but this is just showing some of the, the effects that, that uh, come into play here. So there's the sunlight, what we call insulation. There's thermal emission from the poles. 
Then you have to keep track of the latent heat that's stored in, in the, the CO2, whether it's on the surface or in the atmosphere. There's internal energy in the atmosphere, and then there's also conduction from the subsurface into the cap. Um, the important terms are really the, the radiation term, which is the insulation and the thermal emission, and then also the latent heat of, of CO2. So during the polar winter, for example, when there's no sunlight at all, you're, you're basically just balancing the thermal emission to space against the condensation of CO2. So the latent heat of that CO2 is almost directly balanced against the thermal, thermal emission to space, which is why uh, when I said that the, the clouds tended to block the thermal emission to space, that's why you get less total CO2 deposition um, when you have cloudy conditions. So we can actually quantify uh, how much, we can, we can actually, actually quantify how much sunlight and how much radiation the poles of Mars are absorbing and emitting. And that's what we've done here with using the Mars Climate Sounder data. So basically, uh, you take these snapshots and kind of integrate over the entire year, how much infrared radiation is being emitted, how much sunlight is being absorbed, and you can uh, calculate the balance between those different terms in that equation. So when we do that, uh, one surprising thing is that the southern hemisphere, on average, tends to emit radiation at the same uh, level during its winter as the north, and that's not expected. The reason it's not expected is because the southern hemisphere uh, has higher elevation overall, which leads to lower atmospheric pressure. So when the, the atmospheric pressure is lower, you get a lower CO2 frost point temperature. And since the seasonal ice cap is by definition at the CO2 frost point temperature, you would expect less thermal emission in the southern hemisphere than in the north. So when I said earlier, it's not clear why the permanent CO2 cap on Mars should be at the south pole. That's why, because uh, the northern hemisphere should, on average, emit more thermal infrared radiation than the south. And because the thermal emission to space is balanced against the deposition of CO2 through its latent heat, you would actually expect, on average, the uh, permanent CO2 cap to be at the northern pole of Mars. Now, it doesn't take into account what's happening during the summer, but as I said, the, the integrated insulation, the total amount of sunlight at, at each pole, is, is identical. So to first order, we wouldn't expect the uh, summertime behavior to, to cancel out this um, preference for the North Pole. But what I'm showing here is based on actual data now. So the horizontal arrows there show the measurements um, over the, the respective winters of the, the North and the South. And the fact that the points overlap means that, in fact, contrary to expectations, the South actually emits at the same level as the North. The difference is that the southern winter is longer. I mentioned that the southern summer was brief and intense. The southern winter is longer in time and colder on average. And so when you, when you integrate that thermal emission, you basically end up with a multiplication uh, with the, the length of the season. And because the length of the season is longer in the south, you end up with a preference for the south pole to accumulate more CO2 during its winter. And the actual number is about 12 to 17 percent more accumulation in the south versus the north. Um, so future work, we're going to look at the, the rest of that cycle, the southern, I mean, the, the summer part of the cycle, and see if that uh, plays out. But if, if it does, then this could be one explanation for why Mars has this preference for the south pole as the, the spot where the, the uh, permanent CO2 cap is. Um, we do see interannual variability in the climate of Mars. So. Um, this is not to say climate change, but we, we do see differences from year to year in the amount of, of CO2 uh, frost accumulation and the amount of snowfall. I showed the example from the northern hemisphere. This is also true in, in the south. Um, and so uh, the longer these missions go on, uh, we now have uh, four to five Mars years of data from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The longer these missions are extended, the more of a complete climate record we can get for, uh, for Mars. OK, I'm going to skip to the punchline of this. Um, so there's a, a, a neat model that was put together by uh, Cedric Pularger at Caltech, which um, sort of tries to account for these uh, energy balance terms that I mentioned earlier, so the, the insulation and the thermal emission. And he's able to calculate this sort of boundary uh, across which you would expect disappearance of the permanent CO2 cap or net accumulation 
uh, each year, depending on which side you're on. So this is sort of a, um, a gross climate model for, for Mars, for how much CO2 you'd expect in the atmosphere versus on the surface. And so um, what's shown here is that if you're above and to the right of that line, you'd expect uh, net disappearance of the permanent CO2 cap. If you're on the, the bottom side of the line, you expect it to grow. And we can actually constrain, now the, the parameters shown here are the dust content and then the, the grain radius of the CO2 deposit, which seem kind of obscure, but that's the two of the main things that we uh, observe to vary. And so we can actually put some error bars on this plot of, of uh, where we think Mars actually is based on the measurements. And so those arrows on the bottom um, are the attempt to do that based on the Mars Climate Sounder data. And, and what this shows is that the current state of Mars, as observed by MCS, seems to imply that, that Mars is really straddling this line. And what that means is the, the permanent CO2 cap is probably in, in some kind of equilibrium. It's not to one side or the other. It's not uh, growing appreciably each year, and it's not shrinking appreciably, appreciably each year. Um, and this is consistent with other, other studies that seem to show that a lot of the processes that erase CO2, those, uh, the, the growing of those Swiss cheese features um, could be balanced by other, other processes happening in other regions that accumulate CO2. So it's kind of a wash. Basically, the, the permanent cap remains. Parts of it shrink, parts of it grow. But on average, the permanent cap is, is stable. OK, so I'm just going to finish up with the conclusions. So we've directly measured these CO2 snow particles. They fall in this size range, which indicates that they actually do fall to the surface, so it does snow. The, the snowfall we showed contributes between 3 and 20% and of the seasonal cap mass. Um, and the snowfall produces these granular deposits, which affect the energy balance of the polar regions by lowering the emissivity. Uh, the energy budget and the climate are directly affected by these CO2 snowstorms. Um, and the snowfall seems to be more common in the north, but also more variable. So what we're doing now is we're implementing a, a full CO2 ice cloud retrieval pipeline that will uh, produce this, this type of data for use by the entire community. Um, and then we're also looking at the multi-year infrared and uh, albedo data to, to really nail down that energy budget. I just wanted to acknowledge some people. So the Mars Climate Sounder Science team um, really is behind all of this work. Uh, I'm also supported by the Diviner Science Team, which is the sister instrument on the moon, uh, hence the picture. And um, a lot of this was done uh, both during my PhD and postdoc at Caltech. Um, and uh, those are the projects that support this work. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, first of all, um, I remember when I was a student a long, long time ago, uh, we were talking about the difference between the northern, the northern and the southern cap of Mars, and I'm very glad that we finally solved the issue of why <laughs> they're so different. So thank you for this. Half. <laughs> Half solved. <laughs> but that's good. And I'm, I'm, I apologize. I called you a planetary scientist. I should have called you a climatolo climatologist, because that's what you are, in fact, right? A Martian climatologist? In training. So, OK, that's a better title. Hi. So the f the floor is open for questions. Any question? Yeah. Let's start here then. Um, Ten or twelve years ago, I think uh, the Mars Society was developing plans to uh, use Martian resources, mainly the atmosphere, to produce methane, to burn, to you know move around the Martian surface, and that would spit a lot of H two O into the uh, atmosphere. I presume would that. Uh, change the climate globally? Right. Good question. So the two most important atoms for predicting climate are hydrogen and oxygen, in my opinion. Um, and depending on, on the, the proportions of those atoms, so, so I've been talking about CO2. So there's no H there. There's very little H in terms of H2O in the Martian atmosphere. Um, if you converted all of the H2O to CH4, uh, you would have, uh, I believe, a stronger greenhouse than, uh, than H2O would, would provide. I think they were planning to bring the... To H bring it. Okay. I, I find it hard to believe that they could bring enough H uh, 
to appreciably change the climate. Yes, um, I, I think your, your movie and most of your concentration was on the south polar cap, but the, the north polar cap is really neat in terms of this um, sort of spiral structure and so on. What, what can you say more about that? What establishes the center of the structure and ah. what happens to it? Well, I, I, you implied that, that, that it's both water and CO2, so there's some play. Right. So it's interesting. Um, there's been a lot of work done in the last three or four years on that topic. What what leads to the spiral structure? Uh, what what why why one preferred direction? Uh, why the number of spirals? That, that kind of stuff. So this is actually the South Polar Permanent Cap. Um, both both uh, both residual caps show this spiral structure. In this case, you're seeing the permanent CO2 cap on top of a water ice cap beneath. Um, so we don't, I showed that radar data uh, that shows that, that the um, permanent CO2 cap seems to be more extensive than we had thought. It's probably about a kilometer deep. Beneath that you have several kilometers of, of water ice. And the water ice also shows this spiral shape. So it's possible that the CO2 frost is just draped on top of the spiral shape and the, the water ice is, is actually what has the spiral shape. In the north, um, Again, there's no permanent CO2 ice. The spiral shape is in the water ice. And the work that was done recently um, by Isaac Smith uh, at the University of Texas, um, they have an, a really nice model that explains this using what's called uh, catabatic winds. So basically, the, um, the, the wind direction in, in the polar regions is cyclonic, and it, it, it uh, exists inside of a polar vortex, basically. And, and now we're all familiar with that term. But basically, what that means is that it, it has one preferred uh, direction. And so you always get, um, if there's any topography in the cap, the, the downslope winds, because of the compression uh, as they move downslope, that's called adiabatic heating, that will tend to uh, sublimate or evaporate water ice on the downslope direction. Then as they move upslope, um, if there's any uh, water vapor in the air parcel, it could snow out. So their, their model shows downslope heating, upslope cooling, uh, precipitation on the upslope side. They run the model and they get spirals. And the spirals match the direction that, uh, that we see here. Um, so uh, do Corley Coriolis forces play any role in that, that model? Yep, yeah. So the, 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 the entire existence of the polar vortex is due to Coriolis forces. So as the air is rushing to the polar regions to, to replace all the air that's been condensing onto the surface, um, that air has, it has, to make, it has to conserve angular momentum, right? So as it goes towards the pole, um, being at a, uh, a lower latitude, um, if you imagine the globe, uh, it's, it's starting off at, at, um, with some angular momentum that it has to, to conserve. And as it approaches the, the pole, it has to speed up to maintain that momentum. So you get a, a vortex pattern. So um, I think it's, it's very interesting that it, it seems to be, like with the triple point of water, like a very balanced equilibrium, especially so back to the sort of the South Pole, uh, to keep it stable. And you mentioned that, um, <coughs> excuse me, layers had years without dust storms and years with dust storms. And given that it seems to be a radical difference in deposit based on whether or not there's dust storms, I'm wondering if, when the, as the obliquity changes, whether that will go from equilibrium to some kind of runaway effect and either erase the polar ice cap or make it huge. Yeah, so as the obliquity cranks up, it doesn't take very long to completely sublimate the south polar CO2 cap. So really, you know, on the time scale of 10,000 years, you could expect all of that to go back into the atmosphere. So you would effectively double the atmospheric uh, pressure on Mars. Is that where we're going right now? Is that the direction? I believe so, um, but I'll have to check that. <laughs> uh, how much does downscatter of infrared by CO2 clouds affect this whole equation? And do you take that into account? Great question. Yes, we take it into account. Um, that's the, the main effect that causes the blanketing of the surface deposit, which reduces the amount of deposition at the surface. So he's, he's asking how much the, uh, 
scattered infrared radiation that comes off the surface, hits the cloud particles, and then goes back down, how, how would that affect the deposition of CO2? And that's, that's important. Um, I have a question about this uh, repeatability that you mentioned. Um, we had a session at the AJU two years ago on the fate of habitability, and one of the biologists was saying that uh, if you want to find a place where there is life in our solar system, you need to find a place where there is a stable climate and the, re and the kind of uh, uh, repetitive um, What's You said that how many years of observation we have of this uh, polar cap and how certain you are that this cycle will repeat and for how long? Are we talking about thousands right. of years? So this type of observation we have, um, I believe, about eight or nine Mars years, nearly continuous, uh, starting with the Mars Global Surveyor through um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so far, we see, you know, I, I mentioned the variability in the northern hemisphere. The, the southern hemisphere seems highly stable. Um, but the question that we're currently investigating, I don't have an answer for you yet, is just how much does that heat balance at the poles change year to year? And, and do we see a trend? Is there a warming trend or a cooling trend, and we don't know yet. We wrap it up. Uh, for how long this mission is going to be working? <laughs> we are up for review right now, so uh, we hope to get an extended mission, which would you know buy us another one more Mars year. Uh, <clears throat> the spacecraft itself has enough fuel, I believe, for uh, several more Mars years. I'm not sure exactly how many. And are you expecting anything useful coming from MAVEN for this kind of study? Absolutely. I mean, so MAVEN will mainly touch on the processes that uh, alter the atmosphere. Um, so we'll learn a lot about the stripping of the Martian atmosphere, um, the processes that, that uh, remove atmospheric mass. Um, for the, the polar caps, because MAVEN is focusing on the upper atmosphere, um, we don't expect um, a whole lot of synergistic science between the, the polar stuff and, and MAVEN, but certainly, you know, improved knowledge of the present and past atmosphere of Mars will inform the stuff I'm talking about here. Um, has anyone worked on attempting to estimate the age of the permanent CO2 cap and or the permanent H2O cap? Yeah, many people <laughs> have tried. Has anyone it's succeeded? <laughs> So you can, you can start with, with crater counts um, to get sort of a um, minimum age, sorry, maximum age. Um, but uh, there just aren't very many craters on the polar layer deposits, which tells you they're very young. Um, so we have sort of upper limits on the age of the, of the permanent water ice caps. The CO2 cap is very young. I mean, it, it's... it's um, it's overlapping or overlaying on the water ice cap, so it has to be younger than, than this uh, uh, water ice cap. Um, people have tried to correlate the layers within the polar layer deposits with the known obliquity and eccentricity cycles of the planet. Um, the problem is that's sort of circumstantial because you don't know that the obliquity cycles are actually the, the process that is affecting the dust, non-dust layering. So people have attempted, but there's no firm constraint on, on the actual age. OK, so we're going to hand here with the questions. You're going to stay for a while. So if you want to ask questions, welcome to talk to Paul right now. Uh, so Paul, um, to thank you. And as a memory of you stay at City Institute, you have this uh, wonderful mug. Uh, thanks again for coming and for giving this interesting talk on the climate of Mars. Excellent. Yes, thanks. A lot. thanks. Thank you.